Okay, everyone, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started again. We just had to get everything set up. Um, so everyone online should be able to hear us now. Uh, our presentation today is, uh, so for the next hour, we're gonna be going over how to write an effective ERCAP uh, proposal. So Richard Gerber and Clayton Bagwell are gonna go over that. I will be monitoring the Q&A. Um, do you want me to interrupt you sure. or, okay, sounds good. So if, if there's questions, feel free to just raise your hand if you're in the room or submit through the Q&A and I will read it out for Richard. Thanks. So thanks, Leppy. So I'm Richard Gerber, I'm the HPC department head and senior science advisor at NERSC. So we're gonna talk about how to write an effective ERCAP proposal. Uh, Clayton and I are gonna tag team. So ERCAP is, I have a slide on this. Um, ERCAP is the, the process that we use to take applications for use of computer, uh, of nurse resources, and then the process through which they get, uh, they get um, parsed and then awards made at the end. So we're going to take you through how to um, do this. You know, everybody has to belong to a project at NERSC, and so this is, this is the process that um, the PIs have to go through to, to do it. So we'll start off talking about nurse mission. Um, the thing, this has been mentioned before, but we are what we call ourselves the mission, high performance computing facility for the uh, Office of Science. And so we have the task of supporting the research in the, that's funded by the Office of Science or is of interest to the Office of Science that needs HPC, like nurse can provide. And so any researcher can apply for time at NERSC. Um, if it's relevant to the Office of Science, but of most of the projects that are awarded at NERSC are funded by the Office of Science. The research that the computing supports are, is far funded. They don't have to be, though. But what is important is that every project that comes in is assigned to one of the Office of Science program offices. And Rebecca talked about that earlier, what those are. And then even though you apply to NERSC, to use um, time to get an award. NERSC just collects those, those applications and then gets them to the relevant, a relevant, a program manager in the relevant office. So each office has one or a few program managers that are designated as the NERSC allocation manager. And so they manage that process for their program. So the total um, time at NERSC is divided up among the different areas, um, the different programs, these we call offices. I'll stumble over those words because they keep changing what they call them, but I'll call them, uh, if I say offices or program offices, it's kind of the same thing. And here's the, here's the NERSC pie and how it's divided up. So some of these you might notice are not exactly programs like BES. Like BES internally divides itself up into three one for geosciences, um, biology and chemis chemistry, and, and another one for material science, and they also have one for user facilities. But not all offices do that, or not all programs do that. But, but these are the slices and how much each of them gets of NERSC um, as it relate to what we call programs at NERSC, but they're, they're really the, the, the pools of allocation that the program manager has to give out. I also included ALCC in here, and I think Rebecca mentioned ALCC earlier. I used to um, say we were the mission high performance computing um, facility for the Office of Science, and then exclude ALCC, and then ALCC said, no, 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 we support mission science too. So now I include them in there, um, even though it is a, de a separate pool. The ALCC program is a competitive program that has a whole different uh, structure. They have a website, you can Google them, and how you, so you apply for an ALCC award completely separately from, from ERCAP. And then I also didn't show the nurse director's reserve. The director has about 10% of the total nurse time to give out um, at our discretion. Yes. Are the numbers above percent of the number of people? No, the numbers, okay, so this is kind of a, I stole this graphic. You can ignore the numbers that are just numbers that don't have a percent by them. Um, the percent, is the percent of total time, not the number of users. Oh, okay. Oh, you can hear it, okay. So here's the process, we talked about that, and here's where you apply. We have what we call 
well, I call informally ERCAP season, which is the time right now, August through, I think, October 2nd is the deadline this year. And the most awards are given out as a result of people applying during that time. Now, some program managers, most program managers, but not all necessarily, don't give out all their time um, right now. So awards will be announced in December, and they hold some back in case projects come in during the year. They can, they can fund new projects. So it is possible to get new projects. Um, in particular, you can get um, startup or, or exploratory projects during the year. But most of the time is given out during this season. And then the allocation year itself starts mid-January and runs for a year to the next mid-January. The, the exact dates are kind of historic, and we didn't want to start everything on New Year's Day because everybody's just getting back vacation and all that kind of stuff. So we allocate computer time. We also allocate time on the community file system and for archival storage. Um, but the program managers are a little bit less involved in, in the last two. Well, they'll be consulted for large requests, but they don't typically give out all the awards, although they can. The other important thing is that allocations do not carry over from year to year. So you get an allocation that starts on January 17th, and then it runs for a year, and then whatever you haven't used goes away, and we start a new cycle. Um, and then I, I mentioned that they were reviewed by the program managers. Okay, so how do you write an effective ERCAP request? So you need to do at least two things, but the two things I thought of were, one, you have to make a clear and persuasive request to the program man that the program manager can understand and parse at the Office of Science, and then you have to correctly fill out the form and submit it. So I'm going to try to take a stab at talking more about number one, and then Clayton's going to lead us through number two. But one thing to always remember is that NERSC resources are limited. So NERSC is way we're subscribed. We get a lot more requests than we have hours for. So program managers have to make decisions based on which projects to support and how much time to award. Oh, and let me back up. I meant to say this earlier. Let me interject. On Thursday, some of the program managers are going to speak to, tomorrow. oh, tomorrow. Wednesday. Well, tomorrow, Wednesday, some of the program managers are going to speak to um, you all and tell them, give, give them your, their take on what they like to see and what's important. So if they contradict anything I say, listen to them, not me, <laughs> okay? <laughs> anyway, they have to decide which project to support and how much time to award. And they, they do have a limited pool of time, each of them, and you are in competition with other proposals. So you know, from a practical standpoint, the program managers um, try, to, try to give some time to as many projects as they can but you're definitely in competition with other people for how much because there's a limited there's a limited pool of time. So the program managers really want to award time to the most scientifically impactful projects, those aligned with their area priorities, whatever those are, and they really want to give it to awards to projects that are capable and will make best use of, of the time that they've given out. So strategies for making a successful submission. Um, you want to show how your project connects to the research topics in their program, how your project supports investments their program has made via research grants, right? So they give, so the way the Office of Science works is people apply for research grants to study whatever it is that they're interested in studying, you know, uh, maybe some uh, artificial photosynthesis or whatever it is. You get money for your research project, and then there's a separate process to apply to NERSC for time to support that research. So once they've given out time for research projects, they want to make sure that those projects have adequate resources to do what it is that they said they're going to do. And part of that is computing. They want to make that connection. They also want to know that your project's ready and capable of using NERSC. And if it's a renewal request, like you, you're renewing a, a project you currently have, they want to know that you're, you've produced significant scientific results or you've made significant progress with that previous award. Um, you should make sure that the size of your request is reasonable and appropriate for what you want to do, and that your project needs NERSC and the capability it provides, and you don't have access to other resources that you could use uh, for, what you're, for what you're proposing to do. So there's the, there's the interface, and Clayton will talk more about it. But I'll go through, Clayton will go through all the questions, I think, or most of them. I'm going to go through the ones identified as kind of being the key things that I've heard program managers say that they, they care about. So, uh, 
You, but you probably can't read what's, or maybe you can barely read what's on some of these images, and Clayton will expand on that a little bit later. But one thing I tried to find is that, like, really things that are showstoppers that will really cause major problems and point them out as well as some other things. So some of the showstoppers is on this first project information page, what you are basically doing is, is giving the high-level metadata for your project, like a title and all that kind of stuff, but also what you are doing is selecting which program managers in what program are going to review your request. So it's important to get this right. So one thing is pro what's called project class. So I think it comes filled up with DOE mission science by default. So just don't touch it unless you know what you're doing, I guess would be my suggestion there. Um, and then the allocation year, like right now you could apply for time this year or next year. So just make sure that you're applying for the right year. And then when you click the program, this is probably the most important thing here, is this is where you align your request with what office or what program is going to review it and make an award decision. For if you're primarily funded by the Office of Science, this should be the same as your primary funding source. So if you're funded by FES, if you're funded by Fusion to do a plasma physics research project, you should pick Fusion here, your FES. And incorrectly submitting to the wrong program is like big trouble for your project because what happens is like everybody else, program managers who close their ears, they they will collect them all and then you know kind of do them in a batch, maybe later in the in the cycle that they have to to make these decisions. And all of a sudden these things pop up that they don't think are relevant to their area. They'll say, not relevant to my area, but it's kind of late in the year already, and so we'll try to match them up with the right area, but that right area might have already made their commitments to things. And so it just, it's really important to, take, to pay a pro attention to what program you pick, because that's the area that's going to evaluate your proposal. The funding tab. So the funding tab, um, at first glance, might seem like just a pro forma thing you do, but the program managers really care about this. So they, as I said, they care if this is supporting an investment that has been made through their program already, right? And so putting the, putting the office, if you're funded by the Office of Science, putting the office and program that actually funded you is important to them. They will sometimes look up the research grant number that you put in, so that's important too. And, um, you're welcome to list other funding sources too, but this year for the first time we're asking for a primary funding source. So if it's 50-50, pick one, but pick one based on kind of what I'm telling you today, if that's useful. Um, and then the other thing that is asked for, and this causes kind of endless confusion, is the program manager that funded your research grant. Again, if you're in the Office of Science and you got a, you got a research grant, we want the name of the program manager that's in charge of that research grant. Because what will happen is the designated allocation manager for that office, yes, yeah, Steve, just one second, um, um, will go find the program manager that funded that research and say, you know, what do you think about this? Is this a priority thing? You know, um, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, Steve. So this is the person who's funding, but in our case, we're an experimental program. We have one manager who's doing the experimental program and a different person Approving our ERCAP request. Yeah, so this. The this person is, doing the experiment or the person who's approving the ERCAP request? So, in this place where it says funding program manager, that's the person who's funding your research program, not the, not the NERSC allocation manager that's approving the request. Yeah. Right. Because the one who is approving your request or considering your request, he wants to go talk to the guy that's funding your research. To just say, you know, do they does sound does it sound consistent with what they need? Do they need more? Do they need less? Um, that's that kind of thing, right? So those are two different people, although they, in some cases, they might be the same person. Okay. Oops, I went backwards. Okay, so the security tab. Let's just, uh, go through it quickly. Things we don't support are proprietary research results. Uh, classified information, export controlled, anything PII, protected health information. You just have to just have to agree to that too. Every now and then we do get somebody that says, oh, I'm not sure about my export control or something like that. Um, 
So if you if you think that yes, your export control maybe it's really low level, and you're not sure, just put a put a um, explanation in there, and we'll try to help you track that down. So the project description tab is important um, for two reasons. One related to the success of your proposal more than the other, but you asked for us project summary and goals. And the reason I highlight that here is that we will often take that if we want to highlight your project for some reason, whether it's like in a, a science success story or to communicate what you guys are doing to somebody that's um, maybe not quite as technical as other people might be. We use this description. So we use this description a lot. So make it something concise and descriptive and readable, um, important. And then the next one is called Details Description for DOE Managers. So this is an area that you should just use as you wish, but as you think is would be most effective. So tell anything you want the program managers to know about your request. Um, you'll be asked later to describe your codes and their readiness for GPUs and how you calculate the size of your request. So you don't have to include that here, but um, anything that you might want them to consider when uh, reviewing your proposal goes there. Okay, accomplishments, they do look at accomplishments. Okay, again, they have, they have limited time and they like people that have successfully used the time the year before. So in the accomplishments summary, just tell the program managers what you did with your allocation last year. Um, it could be a result, it could be progress, um, it could be you've worked on the code to make it better. Is that, a, you have a question? Or, no, okay. So whatever, whatever you'd like them to know there. And then the refereed publications. So some of the program managers do look a lot at the publication lists. Um, and I know that some of them get irritated if they see publications that are either 10 years old or that um, look like they were just cut and pasted and half of them don't have relevance to NERSC. Or if they see one that's interesting, they go look for it and they don't find that it acknowledged NERSC anywhere or no evidence that it is NERSC. Um, those are all things they don't like. So um, we do check, we do, and if it doesn't have a DOI, they're not likely to look it up either. So include a DOI. We do check the DOIs against Crossref and almost, almost everything comes up with a valid, as a valid DOI. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question, okay. Could you repeat the question? Uh, Uh, in the accomplishment summary, you know, I, I'd say that, you know, if you're using multiple resources and as a, as a whole, you made some scientific accomplishment or code accomplishment or you did, you know, you did something interesting or I, I would mention it, but I, I would, would make sure that you mention specifically what part the NERSC hours contributed to the overall um, project. Yes. Okay. Into the mic. Okay. Um, it seems like the ERCAP is intended to be one project per proposal rather than one funded program uh, per proposal. If a lab has multiple related projects funded by the same Office of Science grant, should these be submitted as separate proposals? Um, let me see if I understood that. Let me read it. Yeah, so I think if I understand the question correctly, this is actually something we've been discussing with the program managers. Um, so some program managers would like us to have a one-to-one -one mapping, well, for each project to only have, have a direct mapping to just one funding stream. So they could say this funding stream is supporting this project, this sort of stuff. Right now you can put different, different if you have a project that's funded by different agencies or even or grants, you can put them all uh, into one nurse proposal. Um, and I think the question is, if you have, Lippy, you can tell me if it's right. If you have multiple projects funded. <laughs> um, okay, it seems like our cap is intended to be one project per proposal rather than one funded program per proposal. If a lab has multiple related projects funded by the same Office of Science, should these submit, be submitted as separate proposals? Okay. So the program, some of the program managers would like each separate individual grant. 
even if they're all from BES. So if Berkeley Lab has 300 different grants that come from BES, they'd like each one of those to be a different proposal. Um, and what we say is we want each proposal to have a focus of, of science research, right? And so um, we, we, what we don't want is a single proposal that has a wide variety of different research, scientific research foci, foci, foci. So does that answer the question? There's another one. Okay. Okay, can you, can you elaborate on DOIs or val validated via Crossref? Some publications have a publisher provided DOI, DOI that points to a paywall and an open access DOI, um, should, we pref should we prefer one or the other? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I guess when we run these, when we check the, the DOIs, um, they almost all come back as valid. And so I'm not sure I know the answer to that specific question. Um, I guess if you have two different DOIs for the same pub, you could include them both. Um, I think, but I think even if it's behind a paywall, I think Crossref will still return it as a valid publication. But I, I'll have to check on that. I don't know the answer to that for sure. Okay, the resource request tab. So here's where you make the actual re request for how much, um, and this is showing computer time, but there's also one for storage. Um, so one, one, one piece of advice I would say is pay attention to the units. So the requests that use the wrong units have a high chance of um, rejection or failure or something. So how many years ago now, Clayton? Two years ago, three years ago? Two years ago. Two years ago, we had different units. Some people are still in those units. And I don't actually know how they derive their resource requests based on what means we have today relative to those units, but they do. So the new units are, are essentially node hours. They are node hours. So that's how much time your job spends on a node. Um, the old units were kind of based on, on core hours, but relative to some machine that existed 10 years ago. And so they were really funky units anyway. But, but the, the new units are smaller, but people will still make requests for 100 million hours when they really meant whatever 400 less than that was or whatever. And so the, their, 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 their request on the face of it would break the bank of, of each of the allocation managers. Anyway, and so then that just requires a lot of extra work to try to say, what did you really mean? So pay attention. So there's a link there that explains what the units are in case you don't know. Um, and your usage to date, if it's a renewal request, is shown next to the box that is asking for your request. So that, that's another sanity check, um, just to make sure. And then make sure your requests are reasonable. We publish at this link, or you can Google NERSC Call for Proposals 24, that for each of the programs, and I don't expect you to read this, but it's on the web, then um, how much total time they have to give for all the projects that apply to them, right? So you don't want, you for sure don't want to ask for a number that's bigger than that, right? Okay. Oh, and this is just about the node hours. Um, you can ask questions about it, but it's it's really straightforward. Except that we do have shared uh, queues now. So if you're using a fraction of a node, then you get a fraction. You get charged a fraction of that of that node. There's a, an area to talk about your GPU readiness, um, and so we just want you to to give the program manager some evidence that your code can use GPUs. So it can be very short. So um, if you're using VASP6, you can just say VASP6 is GPU enabled, and that's, that's adequate, right? Um, if you have your own code, you might say a little bit more about whether it's ready. You said my code, whatever it is, has been shown to be to work well on GPUs, um, blah, blah, blah. Or if you're code isn't GPU ready, but you'd like it to be and you're working on it, you can put that in there. Just describe what kind of where you are. Um, and if it's a, again, if it's a known application, a known application, um, then you can just say that. And that there's an area where we ask you about codes later anyway, you can just put a link in there. Okay. 
And then uh, uh, there's an appropriate sub request. There's an area for you to put in a justification. So here's where you put in the justification. So we've been asked to collect um, in your typical production run, how many nodes do you use on average? What's, like, what's kind of your typical? Uh, but we're also interested in knowing what would your ideal number of nodes you would use in a, in a job. So what would your ideal parallelism would be if you didn't have to worry about allocations, right? Because um, sometimes people will cut back on the size of their jobs, just kind of stretch their allocation a little bit farther. So we're trying to get some, we're trying to get some gauge on that. Uh, and then uh, just describe how you came up with this number. Like a, I'm asking for a million hours. A, kind of, a little, uh, just give them an idea of how you arrived at that number. Yes, Stephen. This is a tricky question for large collaborations that have I know. dozens of codes. I know. Yes, so particularly you, you're probably the, you're probably the edge, well, I wouldn't say the edge case because there's more and more people in that edge, but you're at the kind of extreme end of diversity within a project. And you can mention that below in the justification if you want to. Right. Um, the codes tab, so we're just asking you to tell us what codes you're planning to run. Uh, and if it's not a known code, you just describe it briefly uh, what it is. So. Um, you can put up to five, uh, put the name, if there's a URL for it, that's useful uh, a lot of times, um, and then describe it very briefly, and then is it GPU enabled. So it's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. The new box we have this year is for software dependencies. We don't have a great way to measure uh, community software packages that you might use, especially if they're libraries. Um, and but we do have to, we do we nurse has limited resources too, so we have to make decisions on which ones we're going to provide and which ones we're going to support and which ones we're going to help people with. So we're trying to get some kind of an inventory, a better handle on what the important software dependencies are for people. And then additional uh, information. So other HPC um, support. So I know the program managers do look at this and they're interested in it. Again, they're trying to stretch their that's trying to stretch their um, their allocation as, as far as they can. So you might think, well, if I don't tell them, if I hide stuff from them, they're, if they know I have other stuff, it might not give me as much, um, which might be a, a, a short-term strategy that could backfire because if they find out later that you really do have more than you are letting on, that makes them unhappy too. So be complete there. And I think that was... Yet, and I'll turn it over to Clayton, unless somebody, anybody has any questions before I do. Okay. Okay, so another DOI, DOI question. Okay. Uh, if it doesn't appear in Crossref, would you then validate it by visiting doi.org as intended? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good that's a good suggestion. So, to be totally honest, where we are with DOIs is we have kind of a, a desired end state that we can, you know, have this great system for uh, collecting publications and validating them and making sure they're right and, and handling any exceptions and things like that. We're not there yet. So, if you put it, I shouldn't say this because it'll contradict me. But if you put it in that list, the program manager will see it. Um, it doesn't get thrown out or anything. It will be there. Um, but we do, if a question comes up, we will try to, we, we will, we do want to, we do want to have, um, we do want to have a way to, to let people get to that publication quickly. And one thing we do use DOIs for is uh, to help filter out, if something comes back and says, oh, this DOI is valid, but it was published in 2003. I will associate that data with it. So that's kind of the primary way. So I wouldn't stress too much about um, the edge cases of DOIs. Um, put in what you have, and it's not going to, we're not going to magically erase it from your proposal if it, if it doesn't validate. Um, but we are trying to move to a future that we can use a DOI actually as a unique identifier for every publication. Are current year ERCAP award allocations publicly available? The, um, the amounts of the awards? We do publish the, 
we do publish the who got awards, the PI name, the project title, and the award amounts um, at some time during the year, yes. Uh, is it only the allocation manager who reviews ERCAP, or are other nurse staff or independent peer reviewers, uh, like, are there any, uh, like, independent peer reviewers who review each ERCAP? Right. Um, so right now, each, we send the ERCAP request for, for mission science, which is 80% of the time. We send the um, request to the program managers, and each program manager has a little bit of a different process that they Imply, they, that they um, employ. So it's, it, right now it's really up to the program managers. Some of the program managers have been asking us if we could do some kind of a technical review to help them with their decisions, which we're open to. Um, we just have to figure out a, a process to do it because we do have about a thousand projects. And so that's a lot of, that's a lot of, um, that's a lot of projects. Okay, one more. Uh, what should we, or, well, yeah, what what should we include in the supporting information documentation? Is it really important? Um, do y'all remember which 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 uh, tab that was? Other Clayton knows. Other HPC support. Supporting information documentation. Yeah. Um. Oh, in those two tabs, other HPC support. So the um. In other words, if you say, oh, I just got a big inside award that's like five times the size of anything you could give me to do this research, then they'll say, okay, you're taken care of, right? So again, that may, you may think that's not in your best interest, but if you, if you really say, if, you, if you're asking for, to do something different than that at NERSC, then that's a stronger case, but they do want to know that you have access to other resources um, because they want to support the research, right? They have limited resources, and so if they can, if they can find some way to make use of resources beyond nurse to accomplish part of part of what they want to do, they would. Uh, and again, it seems like it's kind of um, might be kind of making your case a little bit weaker. Say you have a lot of resources somewhere else, but um, like I said, they they you're kind of in this. Many people are kind of in this for the long game. Like some projects will get allocation of nurse, 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 then maybe they'll get an aside award for one year and then they won't get one the next year, so it's nurse, nurse, nurse. And so you want to build that relationship with the program managers. And so being, being honest with them here is to help them make decisions, I'd, I'd say is the best thing to do. Did that answer the question? Okay. And then in the additional information, you can put whatever you want that thinks you want them to know, right? Um, anyway, okay. All right, anything else? All right, Clayton. You... Hi, all. I'm Clayton Bagwell with uh, NERSC uh, Account and Allocation Support. And um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm usually the person that you'll probably end up talking to if you have questions about RCAP or, or your, uh, your NERSC account. Um, so for ERCAP, you can get uh, assistance from us by um, sending us an email to allocations at nurse.gov. Uh, you can also submit a trouble ticket through the help desk at help.nurse.gov. Um, we are having ERCAP office hours. We're going to have one on Thursday and another one on Monday the 2nd when ERCAP closes and 95% of the people submit their ERCAP request. Um, and there's a, a Zoom link that you can, you can go to in the, to join our office hours. So when you, um, when you log into ERCAP.nurse.gov, you should be taken to this dashboard, which has um, an area for the current request, um, any draft requests that you may have started and uh, haven't finished. Uh, you don't have to do everything all in one sitting. Um, the, there's a section where once you've submitted your ERCAP request while well, it's being reviewed, and then at the very bottom there's a section for your past request. So if you're a continuing project, um, you can go see what you submitted last year and, and work off of that information. Uh, you'll also need uh, the ERCAP number from the previous request to submit uh, a renewal. Uh, here's a little bit closer look at what the buttons and stuff are. Um, so on the Left-hand side, there's this, a navig what they call a navigator bar, um, 
and there's just links that correspond to these buttons for submitting a renewal request for, for next year, submitting a new request for this year, or a new request for next year. Uh, there's also um, the link that says manage my request. So if you log into the help desk and you don't happen to see this, uh, this dashboard, if you go to the ERCAP request section and click on manage my request, that will take you to this dashboard as well. So uh, we try to do, uh, give you as much help in trying to fill out this form as possible. We give you a lot of information and uh, colored fields and annotations. Um, things are, are really important. We'll have a, an asterisk next to them so you can see that if you have to fill something out there or uh, this row of tabs down at the bottom, that means there's a question there that hasn't been answered yet. Uh, we also have some uh, what do they call these pop-ups? You hover your mouse over a, a field and it'll give you some more information about what's required there. Um, and some of these uh, questions are, are uh, actually lists. Uh, so like for programs or science categories, uh, you'll see this little magnifying glass on the side, on the right-hand side of the field. Um, you can get information out of those lists in a number of different ways. You can either put in a couple of asterisks and it'll give you the, the top 15 uh, hits for that uh, list. Uh, you can put in a keyword like some type of science or fusion or something like that and that'll give you a, a narrow down list. And if you have something, some list that's really long like the science categories, if you just click on that uh, magnifying glass, it'll give you another pop-up list with everything that's available and you can scroll through that list or do some other uh, searches to, to find it, uh, such as in this one here. So science categories, there's 56 uh, options. Um, so if you put in physics, that'll narrow it down to the top 12. <clears throat> okay, this is what I like to call the, the request header. So this is the, the, the main information about uh, the name of your project and uh, the project class, the program that you're submitting it to, science category, etc. Um, and program, as Richard said earlier, is, um, is very important. And, and like he said, many of the uh, requests that automatically get rejected is because they put in BER and um, took the top option for BER, which turned out to be the wrong program. So that allocation manager just said, nope, not my program, rejected. And then you have to go through and find out which is the right program to try and resubmit that uh, RCAP request. So one of the first tabs here is uh, personnel. So many um, grants will have multiple PIs listed on them. Uh, but we can only accommodate one primary PI for a project uh, here at NERSC. So any additional senior investigators or other PIs or important people that you want listed uh, associated with this project, you can put them in that uh, first field there. Also, uh, you don't have to do this alone. You can enlist others to help you, and we call them authorized preparers. Uh, so if they already have a NERSC account, the PI can go in. Uh, search for their account and add them to this request so that when they log into ERCAP, they can go find that request and they can uh, add additional information or supporting documentation or fill out some particular accomplishments or whatever, or their publications. Uh, the next tab is for funding. Um, and so uh, the very first question we're asking you is what's your primary funding source? And basically, it'll be a list of all the other options that are on this page. Uh, so if you select the, 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 the option for the funding source that is primarily funding your project, uh, that'll automatically open up whatever it, um, fields need additional information on. And hopefully, it'll be um, a DOE Office of Science. But as you see here, we can also have, like, there's other federal agencies like uh, um, NIH, NSF, NASA, DOD, a whole bunch of other three-letter acronyms, et cetera. Um, uh, we also uh, have options for LDRD funding. 
uh, state or uh, foreign, state or local government agencies. Like we have some um, some projects for Cal Fire and places like that. Um, foreign governments and agencies, uh, universities is of course one of our biggest uh, options. Uh, any nonprofit organizations, and then the final catch-all is other. That's usually some type of industry. Uh, if you do not select the DOE Office of Science as your primary funding source, you will need to put in some supporting information about how your uh, research supports whatever DOE Office of Science that you chose up in the header section that this uh, is going to be redoing, reviewing this request. Um, here's our security information that Richard already spoke about. Uh, project details, again, the project summary, which is kind of the Scientific American version of what your project is doing. And then the uh, detailed description for the DOE managers where they're asking, asking you to submit uh, details about what you're gonna try and do and how you're trying, trying to accomplish it. And for renewing requests, that's where we're going to ask you for your accomplishments and your publications. Um, there's a section for non-refereed materials. That's something that's not published, but might be some other type of uh, workshop that you gave or some other non-official publication that you that you uh, featured in. Uh, Okay, resources tab again. Uh, so and when you're entering uh, information here, you need to enter numbers. <laughs> you can't put in, I need, well, in this case, they were asking for 2 million uh, and they ended up with two. Or even if you ask for just 5,000, you're only going to end up with five. So these are integers. And so if you want 2.5 thousand, you're going to get three, but that's not close to what you want. So. Yes. Be careful when you're entering your numbers here. Uh, we do, um, do I show it here? I don't show it here. Um, we do have a check that looks at uh, the, the reserve for the UE program that you're submitting your request to. And if you're requesting more than 10% of their allocation, we will give you a message that says, you're asking for more than you're probably gonna get. So rethink what you're asking for. Um, uh, then we have the uh, uh, request for G GPU node hours, uh, where we're asking you for your readiness, which we've already talked about. Um, the typical number of nodes your jobs will run on and the, the maximum number, and then the, just justification for your computing request. And it hurts you if you just say, oh, it's based on what past experience has shown us. That's not gonna fly. You need to show your work. You know? So show that you've done some benchmarks or that you show that you've been able to run jobs with X number of nodes for the X number of hours, et cetera. This is what you're planning on using for the next year. Uh, for CFS and archival storage, um, again, we will show you if this is a, a um, renewing a continuing project a renewal um, how much space you're currently using uh, at NERSC um, and you need to ask for at least that much or more for the next year um, and uh, in archive and HPSS that data doesn't go away unless you remove it so it's going to keep growing so you need to um, size your request to accommodate how much you already have plus what you plan on having next year um, and again, these are integers, so even though your usage is shown with decimals, if you ask for a decimal value in the field, it will uh, round it to uh, an integer. Um, some uh, additional questions that we're asking for storage this year is, um, in particular for CFS, are you going to be storing large files on CFS? Or is it going to be a large number of small files? And again, if this is a renewal, um, do you anticipate an increase in the amount of CFS that you're going to be using uh, for the next year? 
And again, uh, show your numbers, give the justification for how much storage you need. Uh, something, an another new question for this year to help us with our planning is we're asking, um, do you plan to be using resources consistently through the year? Um, as many of you know, we have quarterly allocation reductions where if you haven't met a certain usage, um, we will take a certain percentage of your time and give it back to the DOE program managers so they can give it to other people who have overspent, et cetera. Um, if you um, don't think that you're going to be doing being con using consistently through the year, um, you can uh, tell us what you think you're going to be using on a quarterly basis in 10% increments. Um, and then give us a justification for um, how, why that uh, variation in usage. Okay, so do you need uh, real-time access to the computers? Uh, do you, are you running some type of experiment on some uh, experimental contraption, whatever, ALS, who knows what, that's gonna be streaming data to NERSC and needs to be um, processed in real-time? And is this uh, experimental or observational data? And uh, this might also qualify for the question online about special requirements. So if you have a multi-year project, say you've been given a grant for three or five years, um, but you, you have to fill out an ERCAP request for each of those years, uh, you just tell us, you know, yeah, we have a five-year project and we plan to be using NERSC for the next five years, et cetera. Or if there's any other special needs that you need NERSC to provide. Um, and then Richard talked about um, codes. Um, and, and some people have asked, well, I'm just using Python on a notebook, you know, so I don't really have any codes that I'm running. Um, just put in, in this case, uh, for the code name, NA, and just describe down in code description, um, I'm using Python to run some type of stuff through a notebook, whatever. Um, okay, so again, here's the su other supporting information for um, other HPC support or you, you have a local cluster that you use at a, a university or something like that. Um, you can also attach uh, documents to the ERCAP request. Uh, so <coughs> most of these um, uh, text fields are um, 4,000 characters. But if you're real wordy or you need to include graphs or charts or something more descriptive to show what you're doing or what your accomplishments are, uh, you can attach other documents to the ERCAP request that will follow along with it. Uh, at the top of the header, there's this little paper look, look, paper clip looking item, and you can click on that, find the document that you want to add, um, and uh, it'll attach it to the request, and then you just click on the X to close out of that box. And you'll see along the, uh, the top up here, any um, uh, documents that have been added to, to the request. Uh, you can create a PDF of the request once you've finished it so that you can download it and it'll also get attached to the request itself. Okay, finally, um, we asked the PI to tell us that they promised to monitor what they're using and follow the rules and verify that the statements that they made are all true and complete, et cetera. And once all that's done and all of the asterisks have gone away or turned black, uh, you can submit the request for review. And it'll ask you, are you sure? And if you did happen to miss something, it'll give you a message that says, oh, there's a mandatory field you didn't fill out. Go back and find this. And then once you have successfully submitted your request, it'll end up on your uh, dashboard under the uh, submitted requests under review. OK, that's my speed talk. Any questions? Huh? You're early. <laughs> <laughs> 
I have a couple of comments just because I think one of the questions the court might not have been fully addressed about the supplementary information. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can correct this if this is right, but maybe a couple of concrete concrete examples of something you might include there. If say you have an in-house code that's up and coming or something and you don't have anything online for it yet, maybe like some documentation for that or benchmarking. Like, does that sound like something that you typically see in a supplement, like additional material section or would it be something else? Um. That's something you could include. Uh, typically, what we find is uh, a lot of people are used to writing up five to 15 page uh, proposals for trying to get um, their grants or whatever. And they're thinking, oh, I, I got to do the same thing for RCAP. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> but, but you can go ahead and uh, include that under the supplemental information. Um, and particularly anything that might have some type of uh, pictures in it or graphs or something like that. Yeah. If, uh, if, you had, if you had, for instance, scaling plots, I think the program managers would love to see them. <laughs> Did you have another question? No, no. Okay. Can you go back to the um, one that asked about the typical nodes question? So to Stephen's question, are these integer boxes or are they text boxes? Could he could he put in like <laughs> one to twenty or? Uh, I think they're integers. Thousand? They're integers. Yeah. So uh, I don't think, think you can. Okay. This is a new this is a new thing. So we're trying to figure it out. Yeah, so. I don't think it'll support a, a, like a range. There's a question online. Um, so if we are a current nurse user with an allocation received through another group, but we are planning to apply this year as a lead PI, does this count as a renewal or new application? I believe the answer is a new application because you need a new project right. number. Now you have a new project. Um, can we still list our previous nurse allocations usage, node hours and so forth, and publications somewhere in the application? So you, so are, I think they're asking if you're a current user and now you want a project, can you, can you can write you about your past experiences, yeah. justification for what you want? Um, yeah. Sure. If you if you're using that to justify the uh, amount of time that you're requesting, you can say yes. This is how I came up with that number uh, because I've used, I've done this code, run this many jobs with these nodes for this amount of time. Blah blah blah. Yeah, it would be it, it would be good to. Yeah, I, I would include those, but it would also be good to say in there, um, you know, I'm a, I, 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 I did work on this project, and now I'm starting my own project, so basically I, I have experience, I know what I'm doing, and here's what we did in that other project. Okay, with ECP ending, I'm guessing DD ECP is not a valid program for AY 24. Does this mean we should not submit as a renewal if we are DD ECP for mm. AY 23? That's right, you're going out of scope of this discussion here, but um, <laughs> I would say that um, I would I would go ahead and submit to that same program to DDR ECP and um, and we'll we'll look at it. We'll we'll just talk with you about what the most appropriate thing is to do. But go ahead, go ahead and resubmit to where you are now. Anyone in the room? Any questions? Okay, one more online. No, they're waiting um, for the cookies. Yeah, <laughs> understandable. Um, what if you are waiting to hear back on Office of Science funding and want to submit an ERCAP request, assuming it will get funded? Is this reasonable? Um, the thing about renewals is that uh, when you submit a renewal request, it's going to copy a lot of information from your current request. So if you've just submitted a request for a new project, but it hasn't been approved yet, um, that means that the information about your project that's going to be copied over to the renewal will not be there. I think, I think so it's... I think the question, I could be wrong, I, thought, I think the question was if I've applied for funding for a research grant, but I haven't gotten heard back from the research grant yet. Is that, right, they don't yeah. have the Office of Science. No, I would, just go ahead, I would just go ahead and, and apply um, 
and yeah, if, if your research is funded, it's probably a stronger case, but even if it's not, you're clearly doing something that's of interest to the office. And so you could still get an award, even if that research grant isn't um, funded potentially. Thanks. Okay.